Hello everyone and welcome to A Plus Physics. I'm Dan Fullerton and today we're going to talk about Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So let's head over to the A Plus Physics studio. Our objective today includes explaining how Kepler's laws of planetary motion describe the orbits of planetary objects around the Sun. Now Johann Kepler was a German mathematician and astronomer in the late 1500s and early 1600s, and he did a lot to pave the way toward the 17th century scientific revolution, and also set a lot of the groundwork for Newton's laws around universal gravitation. So let's take a look at his laws of planetary motion. Kepler's first law of planetary motion states that the orbits of planetary bodies are ellipses. The Sun is one of the focal points of the ellipse, even though many of the planetary orbits are awfully close to circles. Even in this uh, lesson, we're going to demonstrate them, draw them on the page as if they are very, very elliptical. They're not very elliptical. They're pretty close to circles, just slightly off in, uh, in their elliptical shapes. Kepler's second law of planetary motion is also called the law of equal areas and equal times. If we have a planet over here at P1, for instance, and in some amount of time it moves over here to P2. We sweep out an area right there, area 1. Now at a later point in time it starts at P3 and in the same amount of time it took it to go from P1 to P2, we go from P3 to P4, we're going to sweep out another area. As long as the time intervals from P1 to P2 is the same as the interval from P3 to P4, those areas are going to be equal. All right, that leads us to a nice application. The second law of planetary motion is really all about conservation of angular momentum. If we analyze this from the reference point P over here and recognize there are no external forces or torques, then angular momentum of the system must be maintained. It must be conserved. So we could draw this as the magnitude of the angular momentum about point P is equal to mvr times the sine of angle theta. And in our case, as we're looking over here at mass 2, this implies that mass 2, and let's look at it over here when it's at point A, its velocity at A, its radius at A, times the sine of theta at A, must be equal to its mass, and let's compare it to point B its velocity at b, its radius at b, times the sine of theta b. Now at those two points, theta a, theta b are both 90 degrees. So sine theta a, sine theta b are both 1. We can also recognize we've got mass 2 in both sides of our equation and rewrite this to say that v a, r a, equals VB RB. As you get closer to that object, you're going faster. All right, so that's Kepler's second law of planetary motion. His third law has a little bit more mathematical depth to it. The third law of planetary motion states that the ratio of the squares of the periods of two planets is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their orbital radii. That sounds a whole lot more complicated than it really is, but let's try to dive into it from a mathematical standpoint. As we look at the third law of planetary motion, let's think of this in terms of a circular orbit, just to simplify the math a little bit. Once around an orbit, that's a circumference, or 2 pi, times the orbital radius, 2 pi r. And if distance is speed times time, circumference is a distance, so all that happens at some speed v that occurs in the time period of one period for that planet. Just rearranging this a little bit, period then becomes 2 pi r over v. And we learned previously in our lesson on gravitation that that speed, that velocity for a circular orbit is just going to be the square root of capital G, the universal gravitational constant, times mass 1 divided by our radius, capital R. So I could substitute that in for V and find that period then is 2 pi capital R 
square root of r all over square root of g m1. And that's looking a little daunting. We've got a lot of radicals there. So what I'm going to do to simplify this is I'm just going to square both sides of our equation. This implies then, as I square both sides, that t squared on the left-hand side must be equal to, well, we'll have 4 pi squared. r times square root of r is going to give us r cubed over gm1. Now, with just a little bit of rearrangement, t squared over r cubed, here's that ratio we were talking about, the square of the periods to the cubes of their orbital radii, is equal to 4 pi squared over gm1. This is approximately equal to, assuming mass 1 is our sun, this is going to be approximately equal to 2.97 times 10 to the minus 19 seconds squared per meter cubed in our solar system. So we have an approximately constant ratio of the squares of the periods to the cubes of their orbital radii, and here's the constant it's equal to. Planets that are closer to the sun is what this is really saying. It have a smaller orbital radius, have much shorter periods than planets that are farther from the sun seems to make sense. We have a much shorter year than a planet like Neptune. All right, let's see if we can't do some examples with this now. Example one. Given the elliptical planetary orbit over here at the right, identify the interval during which the planet travels with the highest speed. While well, using Kepler's first law of planetary motion, we know that they're going to sweep out equal areas and equal times, and it tells us these areas are equal. If that's the case, going from 1 to 2 takes the same amount of time as 3 to 4. But as you go from 1 to 2 here, you're traveling a greater distance than you are from 3 to 4. Therefore, you must have a higher speed in the interval from P1 to P2. All right, let's take a look at another example. Example 2. Which planet takes the longest amount of time to make one complete revolution around the sun? Well, we know from Kepler's laws that the closer the planets are to the sun, the smaller their period, the faster their orbit. So which is going to take the longest amount of time to complete one revolution around the sun? The one with the longest period is going to be the one that's the farthest from the sun. So the correct answer here would be D, Uranus. Example 3. A satellite orbits a planet in an elliptical path as shown. Specific positions of the satellite are noted on the diagram as A, B, C, and D. Rank from highest to lowest the following characteristics of the satellite at each position. And we're going to start with speed. Well, if we want the highest speed, if you recall from as we talked about Kepler's laws, that's going to occur when, occur when you are closest to our mass. So it's going to start off highest speed is going to be here at C. Then it looks, we'll get to, looks like D, A is further away, and finally B is the furthest away. So this is from Kepler's second and third laws. How about gravitational potential energy? Well, we're going to have the greatest gravitational potential energy when we're the furthest. So that's going to be B, then A, then D, then C. And that's from our conservation of energy and understanding of gravitational potential energy. If you've got the highest kinetic over here, this must be the lowest gravitational potential energy. Total mechanical energy, however, is going to be the same at all points. Why is that? Well, we don't have any next external forces, no external work being done on the system, so the energy must remain the same, the law of conservation of energy. All right, let's take a look at another example. The shape of Mars's orbit around the Sun is most accurately described as a, and our choices are circle, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola. Hmm. Remember the first law. The orbits of the planets are ellipses. They may be close to circles, but they're actually ellipses. And example five, another mathematical one. 
Given the orbital radius of Mercury is roughly 5.8 times 10 to the 10 meters, estimate the period of Mercury's orbit in terms of Earth years. So we're given the radius R. We want to find the period, capital T, of Mercury's orbit in terms of Earth years. First, let's utilize Kepler's third law in order to find the ratio of t squared over r cubed, the ratio of the periods to the orbital radii. Remember that t squared over r cubed is going to be approximately 2.97 times 10 to the minus 19 seconds squared per meter cubed. All right, that'll get us started. Now we need to solve for the period of Mercury's orbit in seconds. So the period then of Mercury is going to be this value times r cubed, or r cubed times all that, which is 2.97 times 10 to the minus 19 seconds squared per meter cubed times r cubed, which it gives us as 5.8 times 10 to the 10 meters. Our meters cubed are going to cancel out. They'll make a ratio of 1, and that'll leave us t squared in terms of seconds squared. And when I solve that to get t by itself, I find that our period t is about 7.6 times 10 to the 6 seconds, 7.6 million seconds. Finally, let's convert that into Earth years. So we have 7.6 times 10 to the 6 seconds. And here on Earth, one Earth year is 365 and a quarter days times 24 hours per day times 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute or 3.16 times 10 to the 7 seconds gives us 0 0.24 years. And that should make sense. It's less than one Earth year because it has a shorter period. It's closer to the sun, consistent with what we know about Kepler's laws. All right, hopefully that gets you a great start on Kepler's laws of planetary motion. If you need more help or looking for more information, there are tons of places you can go in order to learn more, uh, different places you can find A plus physics on the web. Thank you so much for your time. Make it a great day, everyone. <laughs>